So what's the purpose of this video here? So what we're trying to do is to formally state a bare minimum collection of axioms that will allow us to work with sets that are going to form the foundation for everything else. Okay, in the previous video, we introduced a bunch of definitions, but we didn't really formally justify them. We just sort of said, here's what we're going to be working with. But now we want to introduce them as axioms and the smallest possible collection of axioms. In general, it is seen as desirable to have fewer axioms rather than more, because you want to take as an assumption as little as possible and then actually derive the rest. Okay. Remember that a statement is an axiom means it's logically independent from all the axioms that have come before it. If it could have been proved to be true, then it wouldn't be an axiom. So to be an axiom, it can't be proved to be true, but it also can't be proved to be false. We're not going to be going over why these are axioms, why they can't be proved to be true or can't be proved to be false. Uh, that is a fairly specialized topic. It's really beyond our scope. Okay, but we're just going to go through the list of the axioms of zermelo frankel set theory and explain what they're trying to communicate and what they're used for. So by the end, what we will have is essentially, here are the rules of the game. Here's how set theory is going to work. And uh, then we just charge forward and start proving stuff. So first up, there is a set. This is our first axiom. A set exists. Otherwise, we would have nothing to talk about. You can actually kind of believe that this can't be proved from any of the previous axioms because there are no previous axioms. You just have to start off by saying there is a set and great. Now that I know there is a set, we can actually maybe try to do stuff with it. Okay, so that's why it's necessary. There have to be sets in order to do set theory. Okay. Now we did say that we want there to be as few axioms as possible this axiom is actually not strictly necessary. Some people uh, think that you don't need to declare this at the beginning. Um, at the bare minimum, it's actually going to be replaced by a stronger axiom later that deals with what are called infinite sets. There's gonna be an axiom that says there is a set which is an infinite set. And if there is a set which is an infinite set, there's definitely a set. So in a sense, this isn't necessary, but we don't want to uh, talk about this other axiom right now for a couple of reasons. The axiom of infinity is kind of complicated to state. The, the fact that there is a set with infinitely many elements requires us to discuss what does that mean to be infinitely many. So rather than introduce a complicated axiom that talks about a set that has certain properties, we want to get our feet wet kind of quickly and just get into things. So we start off by just saying there is a set. Let's not worry about what special properties it has. Okay. There's also a branch of math called finitism that says, let's pretend there's no such thing as infinite sets. Um, and it's not even really pretending that there are no such thing as infinite sets. Since the axiom of infinity is an axiom, it can't be proved, which means you can do a logical system that does not use it. And that's called finitism. It says there's no such thing as infinite sets. And um, if that's the sort of thing that interests you, we don't want to nullify it right out the, right out the gate. So we've got the axiom of existence, there is a set. Now we introduce something called the axiom of extensionality. Two sets are equal if and only if every element of one is an element of the other. Basically, we in the previous video defined the equal sign to mean this, but now we're introducing it as an axiom rather than a definition. We're just saying, for any two sets A and B, for any element of the universe, x is an element of a, if and only if x is an element of b, all together is equivalent to saying a is equal to b. This is just our definition of the equal sign, essentially. So the equal sign has a specific property to it, and it's defined through this axiom. Okay, so now what we can do is if I declare a is equal to the set 1, 2, 3, I can come back and I can write things like 1 is an element of a. I don't have to write one is an element of the set containing one, two, and three. I can just replace it with the letter A because here it is and I've declared them to have the same elements. It's a fairly intuitive axiom. It really just formally codifies what the equal sign is gonna do for us. Next up, the axiom of specification. All right, here it is. If A is a set and a P is a predicate statement, then there is a set containing exactly those elements of A for which P of X is true. So given any set A and predicate P, there exists a set P 
B, sorry, so that for any element of the universe, it belongs to that set if and only if it is in A and P of X is true. We've already really used this axiom when we did what we called set builder notation, making truth sets from statements, okay? Given a set and a truth statement, and sorry, a predicate statement, I can make a set of things from the original set where that statement is true. This is now an axiom. Okay, one feature of this axiom is worth being very clear about. It's crucial in this axiom that the set A already exists. We didn't just say, given a predicate P, you can make a set where it's true. We said if A is already a set and capital P is a predicate, then you can make something out of the elements of A where P is true. So the set A has to already exist, and then you can talk about elements of A where capital P is true. In a particular universe, then the truth set can just be constructed, because then if you say the universe is a set, you can just replace A with the universe here, and then you say, great, now I have the set of all things in the universe where the predicate statement is true, provided that the universe is actually a set. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more later about what is and isn't actually a set, because if you're too cavalier about it, you can try, you can accidentally define a set that isn't actually a set, and we'll, we'll talk about that. So, what we're really preventing here is sets that are too big. The only way we can use truth sets through the axiom of specification is to already have a set A and then look at the truth set within it. So you have to already have the set A and then you narrow it down and you specify it through a, a predicate statement P. This is, prevents us from constructing sets that are too big. And we'll get to that later. A set, in a sense, having too many elements or having too much type of different things in it can lead to contradictions. And again, we will come back to that later. Next up is something called the axiom of pairing. For any two sets A and B, there is a third set which contains them as elements. This is not making an intersection or a union. Given any two sets, A and B, there is a set so that the set A is an element of C and the set B is an element of C, okay? This is how we are allowed to construct sets that has other sets as its elements. Then we can do things like make power sets and all of that. It's, it's at least possible to discuss sets whose elements are other sets. This axiom tells us for any two sets, there must exist something that has those two sets as elements. Okay, so similar to the previous axiom, it has an inherent restriction. The sets A and B have to already be sets before I can make them elements of this third thing, C. So all of these axioms, you're going to notice, carry these sorts of restrictions. Assuming something already exists, then you can do something with it. And that assumption, that assuming some certain things already exist, is what prevents us from being too generous in our constructions. You can't just declare whatever you want to be a set. You have to use these axioms and they have these restrictions that certain things have to already exist. The only one that didn't really carry a restriction was our first axiom of existence. There is a set, but that set had no special properties and you weren't allowed to assume anything about it. It's just a set. So <clears throat> this allows us to introduce one more definition. If every element of a set is also a set, you call it a family. So this axiom says there must exist something whose elements are sets. If every element of something is a set, it's called a family of sets. It's not one that we're gonna use very often, I'll be honest. It just means a set whose elements are also sets. It comes up when discussing these axioms, but later on it's kind of gonna fade away. Okay, it does get used in these axioms, however, as we'll see in a moment. The axiom of union, ah, finally, something that sounds familiar. Suppose you have a family of sets. In other words, this scripty F is a set, but every element of it is a set. Then there must be a set whose elements are the elements of the elements of F. Okay, that's not a typo. <laughs> it's more intuitive than it would seem. For any family of sets, there is a set, so that for any set, if it was in the family, then any element, which was in A, is also in C. What it means is that 
I can take the sets that were in the family and I can take their elements and make a new set out of those. That's really just the union, okay? Specifically, here's a family. It just has two sets in it. I have a family of sets, it has two sets. I make a new set out of the elements of the elements of F, out of the elements of A and the elements of B. That's the union. The elements of A and the elements of B. This is just how we have to write axiomatically, it is possible to take the union of two sets. But not just two sets, this was for any family of sets, regardless of how many were in there. So now we can take the union of 12 sets. We can take the union of infinitely many sets, in fact, even though we don't have a notion of infinity at this point, any family of sets it's possible to take a union over. That's what this axiom does. Next axiom of power set. Given any set A, the power set exists. That's really all we have here. Given any set A, there exists a set, so that for any set C, if it's a subset of A, then it's an element of B. I can make a set B whose elements are the subsets of A. There's not a whole lot to say here. Um, it actually does not fall from the axiom of pairing, which had something to do with making sets whose elements were sets. Uh, it has to be declared on its own, but now we can do it, we can construct power sets. Next axiom of choice. The product of non-empty sets is non-empty. This one, this one's special. So we're going to avoid formally writing it out because it involves a few definitions that we haven't introduced, specifically functions between sets, and I don't want to get into that right now. But remember, what is a product set? It's all possible ordered pairs. Suppose I have two sets that are not empty. So the set A has elements and the set B has elements. Is it possible to construct ordered pairs? Intuitively, yes. Choose an element of A and then choose an element of B and make an ordered pair. That's why this is called the axiom of choice. It turns out, however, that you can't actually prove that that's possible without introducing a new axiom. Okay. So for any two sets A and B, if they're both non-empty, their product is also non-empty. It is possible to choose elements from A and elements from B and make ordered pairs out of them. That's what the axiom of choice says. This axiom, however, is not always assumed to be true. Remember, an axiom, because it's totally independent from the ones that have come before it, maybe you can assume it's true or maybe you assume it's false. In fact, it's very common to exclude this axiom. So sometimes, when we assume this to be true, it's called zermelo frankel choice set theory because we include the axiom of choice and you call it ZFC instead of just ZF. It may seem super intuitive that the product of non-empty sets must be non-empty, just choose one element from each. And if you have two sets, that's fine. If you have finitely many sets, that's actually also fine. The real issue comes up with when you take a product over a family of sets and that family has infinitely many things in it. Then things get a little weird. Assuming that this is true, you can always make a choice of a single element out of an infinite list of sets to make a, a very large ordered, you know, you don't call them pairs now, but ordered uh, elements of this infinite product. Assuming that that's always possible can actually lead to some real weird statements. So that's why some people don't like to assume it's true. Because if you assume the axiom of choice, you get some really weird stuff. However, Assuming this axiom is false also leads to some really weird stuff. So whether you assume the choice axiom or not, you're going to end up proving some strange things that are counterintuitive. In other words, intuition is going to mislead you no matter what. Um, the axiom of choice is its a very interesting thing. Most people assume it to be true. Some specialized set theorists like to say it isn't. Uh, in broader mathematics, it's almost always taken to be true, but it's still something we like to be careful about. When you go through a proof, frequently you can ask yourself, did I actually rely on the axiom of choice or not? If I didn't, it might be worth saying that, oh, by the way, this theorem does not rely on the axiom of choice. Or maybe you really did, and you say, my proof relies on the axiom of choice, so if you don't like the axiom of choice, just be mindful of that. So this axiom, uh, we're not going to be too specific about in the future. All of the axioms here, in fact, are not really how we're going to be approaching set theory. We're not 
going to work through our proofs super axiomatically. But those are the building blocks of zermelo frankel set theory, and with this one included as well, it's called zermelo frankel choice, or ZFC. There is another one okay, called the axiom of regularity, which says every non-empty set has an element which is disjoint from it. For any set A, if that set is not empty, then there exists something which is in A and intersected with A is empty. So X has to be a set. It's a set which is an element of A, but no element of X is also an element of A. So it combines all the worst aspects of previous constructions. Sets have to have elements. A has X as an element, but X is also a set. So this set has elements who are sets, but they have elements themselves and they are disjoint from the sets contain what? Okay, so what about the set 0, 1, 2? It doesn't appear to have any elements which are sets. So how can this axiom be true? In zermelo frankel set theory, numbers are actually defined as sets. Okay, so the axioms as stated don't even really allow for things to exist which aren't sets. In other words, in zermelo frankel set theory, I can't just write the number one. The only thing that was ever assumed to exist at the very beginning was a set. Nothing in these axioms allows numbers to exist. You have to construct them as sets according to certain rules, namely the axioms of zermelo frankel set theory. So objects that aren't typically thought of as sets, like numbers, in zermelo frankel set theory are formally constructed and declared to sort of be the familiar numbers. For example, the empty set is declared to be the number zero. The set containing the empty set is considered to be the number one. Um, so numbers are actually sets, and they are sets whose elements are other sets, which makes this axiom something that it can be used. We'll talk about the axiom of regularity a little bit more later. I just I kept it to the end because it is so confusing to state. It has non-empty sets that contain elements which are sets which do not contain elements from the other set A. Okay. Okay. But this just um this axiom prevents sets from being too weird. Even though the axiom is very weird, we'll see later on that this axiom forces sets to not refer to themselves. In other words, A cannot be an element of itself. And we'll see that later. Okay. But not right now. Okay. We did enough already. Okay. All these axioms, just to be clear, we're not going to rely on them too formally. This is not really intended to be a full set theory course in axiomatic zermelo frankel set theory. We're just going to rely on our intuitive notions that we did in the previous video. But declaring these axioms is still nice to see that they are lurking in the background and they really are justifying everything we're going to do.